Hello beloved, uh, thank you for joining me once again. Um, today we'll be covering Psalm chapter 3, I believe the third time now, the third session. But let's read through the psalm together again. A psalm of David, when he fled from Absalom, his son. O Lord, how many are my foes? Many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. Selah. But you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. Selah. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God, for you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Selah. As I said, this is the third time we're looking at this psalm. Initially, we went through verses 1 and 2. Um, and we also went through this initial inscription that sets the context, it sets the scene. And we're reminded just how dire a situation David is in as he flees from his own blood relative, Absalom, his son, right? He's fleeing from him. And the situation as a high level summary is that David's son has murdered one of his other children and David eventually forgave him and welcomed him back in. Um, Absalom worked for years to essentially lead a coup d'etat and take David's throne, his people, his council, his women, everything from David. And David has to flee away. And David now finds himself in the Mount of Olives, um, similar to where our, our Lord found himself right before he died, uh, where he went to pray. And David is now dealing with the reality that he's facing. And so David has said that he's fighting or he's against many, many, many um, issues, right? He's got many foes, many rising against him, many who are saying of his soul um, that there is no salvation for him in God in particular, right? And so it's a difficult time for David um, because not only are they against him and t attacking his life, they're even attacking his hope of eternity with God itself. Um, we then looked last session at the fact that David's response to all of that after pausing um, amidst this sailor these sailors have really broken up the text into three sections in particular but um, and this first section was really setting the scene of the difficulty that David finds himself in um, in this second section we see that David opens up with a but so in contrast to all his faith once he pauses and thinks it through David realizes but God himself the Lord is his and he and he breaks it down into three things. He says the Lord is his shield. One um, is his glory. Number two and is the lifter of his head. Right. Number three is a shield about him um, more specifically. And so we looked into those things. And actually, I was meant to do this session, this this next verse alongside verse four, alongside verse three. But um, time didn't allow. Uh, so I, I, I'm doing them separately. But but this is now where we find ourselves. So David is now, having thought through everything that he's going through, has now to come to the conclusion that God is worthy um, to be looked to, that God is protecting him, that God is altogether glorious. And so there's something worth David lifting his head to. And when David does lift his head, very specifically, when he lifts his head, David does what? The first thing that David does in this entire psalm the first thing that he's that we actively see David David doing the first verb aside assigned to David is that David cried aloud to the Lord he cried to the Lord right that's David's first response prayer right David's first response in the midst of difficulty in times of trouble is to pray and the reason David can do this is because David doesn't just come to the Lord when times are difficult, but David knows how to spend time before the Lord when times 
are good. You see, the thing is, we don't always know what it looks like to run to God as our first point of call. Sometimes we face difficulties and the first thing we do is we want to talk to everybody else about it except from our God. Or sometimes we face difficulties and, 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 and the first thing we do is we want to vent and, and, and let out our frustrations to the world or, or, we, or we lash out or whatever. But what we should really be doing, David models it here. The first response is not to for him to muster up his army to go and fight. His first response is, is not to try and strategize how to take down his son Absalom. His first response is to cry out to the Lord. The Lord specifically is the only one who can help David. You see, David has lived a life whereby his natural posture is one of helpless dependence on God. And therefore, as a result, when times are good, David knows to spend To come to the Lord with thanksgiving and praise because the Lord has done it. But when times are bad, David instinctively knows it's only a time to cry out to the Lord again because only the Lord would keep him. right? And we see this more and more because David goes on to start saying things like, you know what, even when I lay down and sleep, it's only because the Lord sustained me and woke again. It's only because God sustained me. You know, he goes on to even say, "Um, I will not be afraid because of all these people that will arise against me and not because he will save himself but because God will save him save me oh my God right salvation belongs to the God God will fight for me and break the teeth of the wicked and strike all of my enemies on the cheek right blessings be on your people right David could have mustered up his own people but the people the person who David looks to for help is God alone and so David lives a life of consistent dependence and helplessness, um, dependence on God and helplessness. When he when he looks to himself, he sees that he's nothing by himself. And this reminds us that apart from divine help, we are truly nothing. David, of all people, if there was anybody who should have thought they were something. It would have been David. When David thinks about all of his powers and all of his royalty and his glorious king, David should have thought himself something. David was fleeing with a small battalion. David could have put his trust in them, but he didn't. Instead, he cries aloud to the Lord. The Lord is David's strength. The Lord is, as we've seen, is David's shield, his glory, and the one who strengthens him as a lifter of his head. And so David cries aloud to the Lord and it's not just that David cries aloud to the Lord, but it's the fact that David cries. David's used to having servants do so much for him. And it's a blessing as well to have other people pray for you. But the verse is actually, the way the verse is, is it emphasises that it's David crying out specifically when it says, I cried. It's interesting that other translations actually render, render this um, something like, um, I cry to the Lord with my voice. Um, with my voice, right? With my voice, right? If you were to look at other translations, it's emphasizing the fact that David came. David knows he has an audience with God. David knows there's something special about him being able to come, something special, something deeply moving and relationally telling about the one who's able to come to God directly and personally and with his own voice. And it's a reminder again, when was the last time we cried out to the Lord? When was the last time you brought all of your hope and trust and emotion to prayer? When was the last time you you wept to your father? There's a very, the amount of time that we spend in prayer is particularly telling of how much we depend on God the more we realize that we do nothing in our own strength the more we find ourselves in a posture like David's on our knees with our heads lifted to the heavens crying out to the God who has to even give us strength to cry out that's 
the posture of the Christian. You know, when we cry out as well, notice this, the, the way the verse flows. It's not that we're crying out into thin air. We're crying out to the Lord. And because we cry out to the Lord, he answers. Right? God answers. It's not us crying out or weeping into thin air. It's not us speaking to the waves or hoping on a wish. We're meeting with our Father, right? When we cry out in prayer. And we don't serve an idol who's got eyes but does not see and ears but does not hear and arms but cannot save. But we serve a God who knows our pain, who sees our suffering and who hears his children's cries. We have a God who listens to us and who answers us. And therefore, you know, even in the face of death, right, betrayed by a friend, sweating drops of blood, soon to be abandoned, and soon to have the world sins all upon his shoulders, even our Lord in this same garden, cries out to a father who hears, so that we too would know there's no situation, even the situation of death itself, where we can't also cry out to this God. And just to end, similar to what we saw in verse 2, um, how that ended with a sailor for us to essentially pause and think and, and, and just, just to reflect on what's been said. Again, this natural separation, this natural way of breaking up the verse. David applies another Selah here for us to be reminded. This is something to think through. Previously, we paused to think through the fact that the situation David found himself in was one of the most difficult trials a man could face. And now we're asked to think through the mercy available to us as we pray to a God that hears. Amen.